being a true Christian isn't the center of our life. And the reason it's not the center of our life is because we're too mixed up in the world. So sometimes, though we have these duties and obligations as Catholics, as Christians, to live our baptismal promise, we don't think about our baptismal promise. Though we've been confirmed unto blood, the shedding of our blood in the defense of the faith, we don't think about our confirmation grace. Many of us, it doesn't mean anything. I don't even remember. Uh, I remember standing there and having a bishop there, but I don't remember anything else about it. It meant very little to me, confirmation. And that's what happens when, when we just start to live habitually our faith without entering into um, the essence of what it is. You were created by God to give him glory and honor and to go to heaven. But he doesn't make anybody go to heaven. So the only people to go to heaven are those who become perfect. And what he gives us in the sacraments, and that's the whole reason for the church is to maintain the sacraments, those are graces won at the redemption, given to us by our Lord, administered by the church to make us perfect. There's first the work that God works, and then there's the work that we cooperate with, objective and subjective redemption. That'd be a talk for another time, but we just mentioned it. So we have real duties. We have duties as Christians that we have to fulfill because the good and almighty God willed for us to exist and wants us forever in heaven, but he won't force it. So how do we enter into that? How do we live that? Well, we live it, as, a, as the apostles talk about, as the saints talk about it, by separating ourselves from this world <clears throat> and for, for striving for the grace and the glory of heaven by his grace. Do you see? So what do we do when we start to lose track of it? Or how do we get back on track with it? And this is what I think is attracting so many people from the time of St. Francis to now, and it's starting to work even within our, our little group, attracting people to the third order. It's giving them, it's giving them one, a wake-up call, and two, an outlet for following Christ. That's why we made this little medal, chasing after Christ. They talk about overcoming Christ. And that's what St. Francis is doing in that medal that we had made. It, you have him chasing after our Lord with a cross on his shoulders, and you've got our Lord carrying his cross, looking back at St. Francis, and St. Francis stumbling after him, but with his eyes completely wrapped on our dear blessed Lord. Do you see? Which is a magnificent thing. That's what we should all be doing. But we have to ask the question, is that what we're doing? Is that what we do by saying a few prayers every once in a while and making sure we go to Mass on Sunday? Maybe if you stay out of grace, if you stay in a, in a state of grace and you and you don't and you don't commit any mortal sins, heaven's going to be yours someday, right? But is that really the way to win the greatest thing you could ever be given? Anyone who wants to want, run and win a medal at a race, they they run, they run and they run and they run, putting absolutely everything into it until the day they have to finally run. You see? But we don't think about heaven that way. The greatest thing you could ever possibly receive, and it lasts forever, and we think we're going to stumble in the front door? You know we do. Most of us do. And the reason I know that you do, because I've lived out there too. And why do we? Because of the world. We love it. We love its comforts. We love its delicacies. We love its honors, right? We love what it's going to give back to us. Most of the time, our faith has to do with one thing, us. And that might not make a lot of sense to you. And if it doesn't make sense to you, it's something to think about and pray about and meditate on. What does he mean? Our faith has to do with us. And that's the thing I've been talking to the Third Order about for a while is coming to understand that if we don't have that kind of faith where we're at the center of our life is God and we serve Him, we love Him and we are loved by Him, instead of we are at the center of our life 
and God is there to give me what I ask for when I ask for it, and if he doesn't, it's worse for him. Because really, he has to be at the center, and if he is, everything makes sense once he's at the center. But when I'm at the center, there's nothing but pain and sorrow because I can't really obtain anything for myself. So that's why I beg God when I know I need something, I finally talk to God about it and he doesn't give it to me. Do you see? Then I get upset about it because I didn't get what I wanted. God doesn't hear my prayers. And you say all these negative things about God. Do you see? But it just doesn't, it doesn't work that way because God's all providence and only created us for, there's a, I was just reading it the other day, I wish I had a good memory, because it, there's all of these, when you go through the Psalms and Proverbs, you get, you get all of these different quotes that talk about how God will take care of even the birds and the little animals of the forest, how he thinks of them and provides for them, and yet they don't get to go to heaven. I know that's going to offend somebody because... <laughs> You know, you know, but anyways. So what I want to do in this talk is kind of bring, as, as always, I'm trying to kind of always focus on the same thing, but it, it's to try to bring our attention back, <clears throat> our focus, to put things in right order, right? And also to heed, to heed the words of our dear blessed Lord in the apocalypse. Whoops. We don't like to talk about the apocalypse. One, we don't understand it ever. But I will tell you, once you, put, once you put God in the center of your life and you start to serve the living God because he's the center of your life, the apocalypse will make a lot of sense to you. It, it actually is very plain. It's not very mysterious. There's all kinds of mysterious symbols and stuff, but you don't have to get caught up in the mysterious symbols. It, 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 that, I mean, uh, you know, 144,000. Well, though we, we know who they are. The 144,000 are the Jehovah's Witnesses. So they're the only ones that are in heaven. We know what that number is. So that, that, that one's not a mystery anymore. But, but all the other numbers, when you have the different colors and you have the different angels and you have the different woes and you have the, all these kind of these things, yeah, they could be mysterious, but you don't need to lose sight of the forest for the trees. For Serafina, I get that right? Yes. Okay, I got it right. Yeah. <laughs> they make fun of me because I always get the sayings wrong. I, I'm, I'm not very good at that. But in the apocalypse, if you read it, you can, you can kind of see history unraveling and even our own present day unraveling. It's not to say that everything that's happened in the apocalypse right now is just right now because people have always thought that. Um, but there's something going on right now that's going on in the apocalypse. It's in there. But here's something that I think is very pertinent to us. And I hope, I hope to bounce back and forth between this and a letter of St. Paul. But it, it takes, it, I was thinking about this this morning in my meditation. When our Lord cries out, and this is in chapter, chapter 18, he's just talking about the, the, the whore of Babylon. He's talking about Babylon. Babylon the great has fallen the haunt of all kinds of evil spirits and unclean, hateful birds. I'm not going to go into all that. But he says, because all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. This is what we have today. All, all the leaders in the world, they're, on, they're all on board. They seem to be on board. That's not what I want to get into. I'm not interested in bringing this necessarily to present for all of that stuff. But you can see how that could happen. At least from the examples we have today, you could see how that could happen. And the merchants of the earth have been made rich by the power of her delicacies. That's everything you find today to buy. It's all about pampering you, making sure you have what you want. You even see the advertising, which when I was in England, what was it, five, six years ago now, I talked to one of the English brothers because they... They, they seem to be using the English language in a very strange way. Like, um, I, I don't even have good examples right now. And I asked him about it. He said, he gave me some example about, you know, just kind of the, the loss of when, when things aren't um, ordered and people aren't, you know, necessarily attached to reality. They start to pervert the language, whatever. Now it's all here. 
I've really noticed it in the advertising. Like you'll see it on a box of cereal or coffee or something. It'll say something that doesn't make any sense, but it's all about happy and you. These are basically the words, and they'll use them in different ways, but it doesn't make sense. It, like the way they're using the language doesn't make sense. And I went to public school, so I don't really understand grammar very well, but I do know when I'm reading the thing, and it just says like, the happy, the happy for you, the happy for me. I'm inspired now. I want your donuts. I want your donuts because it's the happy in me. It's the happy in me. But it's the delicacies, and this is how they sell things today. It's all about you. It's to make you happy. It's the whatever. But So you can see the merchants of the world and their delicacies. And I heard another voice from the heavens saying, Go out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not her plagues. What plagues? COVID? No, we're not talking about real plagues here. We're, we're talking about the effect that when we allow ourselves to be immersed in the world, the effect it's going to have on us, it makes us worldlings. It makes us think of the world. It makes us think of the earth. It makes us start to revel in the sins. Then you start to know people who revel in the sins, and now you have to justify because those are your friends. How am I supposed to say these people are going to burn in hell? Well, first of all, we don't say anybody's going to burn in hell. That's up to God to decide. I don't know who's going to burn in hell. I just know people will because our dear Lord talked about it. Somebody's going to be burning in hell, but it's not for me to say you're going to burn in hell or you're going to, we don't, I have no idea. That's, that's, a, that's a judgment on God. He reads souls and I don't. But we can often see, uh, St. Paul even talks about the, um, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. What he's talking about is being around people that you shouldn't really be around. People of bad a reputation, or people of, you know, especially Christians that aren't living properly. Because you start to see these are good people on the natural level. And then you start to fall into what they fall into because how could God, how could God punish them so severely? I know they're not doing what's right, but they're good people. Because we see the natural. We live in the natural world. We're called to be supernatural, and that's what's happened in your baptism. It's not just this simple thing that happens. You go from being a natural creature to a supernatural creature. You were once in sin, that is, a son of wrath. Those are the words of St. Paul. That's what we were because you were in sin. It's original sin, but it's still enough sin to keep you out of heaven. And if it, if it weren't true, why'd Christ have to die on the cross? He did it to alleviate original sin, not just the fornications and all the other filth that they talk about. Original sin blocked men from heaven, as it does today. That's why it's worth dying for, to teach baptism it's the first thing. Christ died so that we could be baptized. He, that's where the efficacious grace comes from in all the sacraments from his death. But I want to go and look at St. Paul. We'll probably come back to this. But this is a powerful thing because this person speaking is our Lord in the apocalypse. He's, he's crying out. You can hear him. He, he's not just there simply waiting for everybody to get to heaven so he can give them a big hug. That, 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 that's not reality. Come out of them, my people. Don't take, don't take part in her sin and be a part of her plagues. St. Paul says, when he talks about people receiving, this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I believe, when he talks about unworthy reception of Holy Eucharist. And he said, and this is why many of you are sick and some have died. Unworthy reception of Holy Eucharist. That's not Friar Anthony. That St. Paul said that. How dare he say that people who sin might actually die from it? Do you see? So now we can understand. I'm not saying this is the official interpretation of the church. I'm just giving you an interpretation here. And that you receive not of her plagues. What plagues would the world give us? It isn't so much a problem that my body gets sick and dies. It's that my soul perishes in hell 
for the eternal death. It would be better just to be absolutely brutally murdered by heretics or heathens for the love of the faith. Because to lose your life, you gain it. The Lord said that. So let's go to St. Paul. I just want to read down through his letter. There's two chapters here. I don't know if I should read them both or not. But at the beginning of, so it's a letter to the Ephesians. And I'll bounce around in chapter four, but I really want to get to chapter five. And I just want to give a little commentary as I go down through it. But with that in mind, the apocalypse and what our dear Lord said, begging us to come out of Babylon, Babylon the Great. And what we can understand Babylon to be is any place where there's revelry and natural things, right? And most of you already live that way. You live in Babylon. Most of us, in, we, we, we cooperate that much with the world. We don't see the difference anymore. And that's why I want to bring this up. Because if we're going to enter into the third order, you really do have to take that greater step. And really, it's for anybody who's baptized to take that greater step to holiness. Because if we were holy, the world would not be in the state that it's in right now. Because you'd have, holiness, it just changes stuff. You'd still have revelry, you'd still have major problems. But holiness, it affects other people. And it also allows you not to be affected. Does that make sense? It calls down grace from God. Being holy, simply being holy, which means transformation of self into Christ through His graces and through work on yourself, meaning practicing the virtues, right? Becoming an authentic soldier of Christ uh, according to the gospel. To do that draws down mercy from God on our neighbor. So yes, we are called to love uh, God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. But a question for you is, do you do that? Then after that, to love our neighbor as ourself. We are our first neighbor. You are your first neighbor because you have to be good to yourself. If you're impatient and calling yourself names, you are not, you're not being charitable to your neighbor because you're your first neighbor. We think it's okay to beat ourselves up and call ourselves names when nobody's around and just degrade ourselves and whatever. We won't let anybody else do it, but we'll do it to ourselves but you're not being charitable to your neighbor. You're actually, you're, you're actually sinning against charity against your neighbor. And then to love our neighbor as ourself. That means uh, the one closest to us, anyone. So St. Paul says this, I therefore, a prisoner in the Lord beseech you. And you could take, I mean, you know, a prisoner in the Lord, we religious, we're prisoners in the Lord. So you can take it as understanding we're prisoners in the Lord because we give up all of our freedom and we do it for the love of God. St. Anthony said, freedom is slavery and slavery is freedom. So religious are free, though they give up their freedom. I therefore, prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation in which you are called in which you are called. That's by your baptismal promises. It's a vocation we all have, right? With all humility and mildness, with patience, supporting one another in charity. Now, I could go through and comment on every line. We don't have time to do all that. But the thing is, when we read this, we, have to, we don't read St. Paul and try to understand, understand what St. Paul is saying to those people right now in that circumstance. That's a good thing. That's a good way to study Scripture. But when, when I want to conform myself to the Gospel, I need to know what he's saying to me. You see? What does it mean here? With all humility and mildness and patience, supporting one another in charity, we know in most Christian communities today, there isn't that support. There isn't that charity. We write people off. As soon as they do something we don't like, they're written off. So St. Paul is making a point here. He's saying, careful to keep the unity of the spirit of the bond of peace, one body, one spirit, as you are all called in one hope of our calling, our Lord, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one faith, one baptism. 
one faith, one baptism. Do you see? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Not a multiplicity. So what we have to do is we have to understand what he's getting ready to go into here. Authentic faith. Being a member of it should mean something to you. Those who are members of it should mean something to you. Understanding what makes you a member of it isn't just the fact that you go to this church or that. By your baptism, when they say member, like I always say, it's not like a card membering, card carrying member of Anytime Fitness. You're not that kind of member of the body of Christ. And if that's true, which I think sometimes our faith is weak on that point because we don't really understand what that means. If that's true, you're obviously going to care for your body, which is your neighbor and yourself. And that's what the Christian unity is. But we don't mean in multiplicity. One Lord, one faith. What was the other one? One baptism. Look at that. We got it. We got a prayer and for God. But every one of us is given grace according to the measure according to the measure of the giving of Christ. It seems strange what this means, but you can understand when you enter into something, as some of you are tomorrow, you enter into a form of religious life, you are given grace according to the measure that's given of Christ, meaning of your disposition. This is always important. Whenever we receive the life-giving sacraments, they make us holy. There's a ex opera operato, the one where Christ works in us a work of holiness without us doing anything. He makes us holy at Holy Mass. He makes us holy when we confess our sins, when we've actually sinned and need to be revitalized. He makes us holy when he does that. And in all the other sacraments, he makes us holy. But then there's a subjective part to this. Only there's a work that already works. But then there's the disposition of you being able to receive. Now, I've talked about it before. In the Philippines, when we would, um, we didn't have the, the water there, you couldn't really drink. We had, we, had, we had a well there that you could pump, but the sewage went to the same level that the water came out when you pumped it. So we would bathe with that. <laughs> and eventually you'd get a rash. It was kind of, it's kind of sick, but you know, it would, what do you do? Then the water that you would use for washing your clothes, and, and I would try to sneak some of that to take showers with too, but you, they, had, they had these big um, buckets around. So the water would come off the roof, and it would just go into the 55-gallon drums, and you just have water sitting there, and you'd fill up your bucket and go um, so you didn't have to use the mixed sewage water. Kind of like an elephant. You just kind of throw the, the cups over your head and, and wash that way, which is a wonderful way. But... To collect that water, there's a couple different ways you can do. If you just put, if you put a bucket, if you put a 55-gallon drum out there and you take, leave the lid on it, you put holes in it, you'll get water in there. But you're just not going to get much water in there. You could take the lid off and you'll get more water in there. Or you could run all the pipes into cisterns behind the place and get all the water into the big cisterns. See, what you're doing is you're disposing... For water, you're disposing for availability of water. You're taking the lid off, you're putting a, butt, a big big pail there. Now you're moving pipes, you're putting them into cisterns. You're disposing yourself for the availability to receive larger quantities of something. That's what our subjective, our subjective disposition has to be. Uh, we have to be able to dispose ourselves to receive those extra graces, right? <clears throat> because it has to be a hand-in-hand -hand work. We have to work with our Lord um, longing and striving to become holier. And if you do that, you'll become holier, right? Because that's what he wants us to do. That's what our assignment is. That henceforth... I'm going to skip down a little bit. That henceforth we be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the wickedness of men, by cunning craftiness, by which they lie and wait to deceive. But doing the truth 
in charity. Now I want to go back to the first part here. This is that thing that happens with us being in Babylon. We get tossed to and fro. And that's what we watch. We watch it. All the young people watch it with their families. You're all guilty of it because you're out there in the world. It's seductive, the world is. We're, we're all guilty the longer we're out there. And that's why it's so dangerous. St. Bernardine of Siena, and understand what he's saying properly. But he says, for those who remain in the world, they must fall. That's what he says. They must fall. What does it mean? Well, it doesn't mean that they necessarily fall into mortal sin because they don't have to fall into mortal sin. It, that, that's, that's a choice that a man makes. It's not God never forces someone to become his enemy. He doesn't do that. But to be tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the wickedness of men, this is where we're at. We all face it. You face it every time you put on the news. You have no idea what messages are feeding you, and you don't know if it's true or if it's false. You have no way to back it up or figure it out. You're just kind of stuck making a decision. Do you want to believe them or not believe them? And if you believe them and they're wrong, this is where it comes down here later, it talks about, but doing the truth in charity. So entering into a form of religious life and entering, in, that is, trying to live our faith more deeply, we're trying to enter into the truth. And who is the truth? See that? It's a person. It's our Lord. And that's why there can't be multiplicity of faith. There can only be one faith. There can only be one Lord. There can only be one baptism. There can only be one. But as we do this, but doing the truth in charity, that we may in all things grow up in Him who is the head, even Christ. That's imitation. And that's exactly what the Franciscan order came about to be. St. Francis wanted to perfectly run after our Lord, perfectly imitate our Lord. Anything he did, he wanted to do it too. That was the goal of St. Francis. People saw that and they wanted to follow St. Francis until we get to the Pope saying, imitate St. Francis. You see, taking the words of St. Paul and now applying them to St. Francis. Magnificent. But our goal here is to grow up in all things in Him who is the head, even Christ. This is the goal. That's why we don't allow ourselves to be tossed to and fro, but we have to find ourselves um, rooted or anchored deeply in authentic faith so that we can't allow the world to keep pulling us into its Babylon and letting us be affected by its plagues. Heed the word of our Lord, come out of her. What a, what a compassionate little plea from our Lord. Come out of her, my people. He looks at us and he sees all that we, he offers us. And he offers us a new way to actually be in peace and to live a heroic way of life. And yet we follow the whore of Babylon. We hate to say it because it sounds you know, kind of crazy, doesn't it? But it's not talking about that figure that will be the whore of Babylon. We're talking about that figure which is the world. St. John talks about it, the concupiscence of the, of the eyes, of the flesh, and the pride of life. The world, the flesh, and the devil. It's the letter, first letter of St. John. So the concupiscence is something we're all faced with. The world lures us in. And if we don't fight it, we just let it, we get tossed to and fro. And there's always doctrine involved with it until we don't believe that people go to hell anymore. Why? Because all the doctrines say that they don't. We don't, we don't believe it's, it's, it's wrong to be part of this church or that church or to do this thing or to go to this place or to, to have these kind of friends. We don't think that's wrong anymore. Why? Because we've been tossed to and fro by the doctrines of the world of evil men. That's what St. Paul says. From whom the whole body, being compacted and fitly joined together by what every joint supplieth, according to the operation of the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edification of itself in charity. Our participation in the body of Christ 
lived heroically leads to the edification of the people. You see? Good example. That's what St. Francis did, and so the popes tell us to even follow. So how do we do it today? This is what the Third Order is called to. This is your apostolate. Your apostolate is to be a heroic Christian. You don't have to go out on the, I mean, some of you might do it. You might actually be called to do it. But you're not all necessarily called to go stand on the street corners and, and holding the Bible in your hands, screaming and yelling at everybody, right? Somebody might have to start doing it, but not everybody's going to do that. You know what's going to, and then even, even in your workplaces, which some of them are horrible. One of our third order members called us the other day, and she's just like, what do I do? I don't think I can even go back there anymore. And she's telling me about the filthiness that people, I mean, it's just, once she explained the filthiness, I said, just leave. If you can take care of yourself, just leave. What are you going to do? You'll complain and you'll just get fired anyways. So, But that edification that comes from someone who enters into a deeper form of, uh, of their religious observance, which is the third order, is someone that when you're out in the world, you don't have to make a show of your faith. That cross that you all wear, that, that towel cross that you all wear, it, 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 it's not that it makes a show. People are mesmerized by it. What is that? That's beautiful. What is it? And there you go. You just have to talk about the cross, St. Francis, the Blessed Virgin, our dear Lord. You can go through the whole thing. Now you can evangelize. But what if that never happens? They don't ask you anything. Eventually they're going to say, why are you different? Why don't you swear? Everyone else is constantly swearing. Why don't you swear? Why do you always wear long pants and a long shirt? Why do you always wear a dress that goes down to your ankles? Ladies like to watch other ladies. And so what a lot of women tell me is that they get criticized because why are you wearing a dress all the time? Why? Can't I wear a dress all the time? I mean, that's what, the, I, mean, that's what I tell the ladies to say. You don't have to answer them. Just say, well, I, I like wearing dresses. Why, why, is it wrong for me to wear a dress? <laughs> and then the men, like, you know, the long sleeve shirts, like, you have to really wear that when it's hot outside? Why? I can't wear it when it's hot outside. And you can talk about penance if you want to, you know? They're beautiful things. Why can't men dress in a dignified way today? Why can't they do it? Why can't women dress in a dignified way today? Why, why can't they do it? Why, why, why aren't they free to do that? So eventually they ask. And they might be offended. Maybe they're not offended. Um, but eventually you might have an actual impact because they see Christ. And that's who they need to see. That's the whole point of the third order now. Understand, we friars aren't going to go out there. We stay inside. We pray. We work on the mountain. And we're trying to build a place for you to come to. We want to form you to be Christ according to the thing you've already... That's, that's according to your confirmation grace. So that the world will have Christ again in the world. We need, we need Christians who are actually living their confirmation grace. When that happens, there will be much mercy for men. There will be a lot of good example and many graces will pour out on people. But we have to have Christians acting like Christians. That means the first and foremost, the thing most important to you has to be heaven and obtaining it. But only for the glory and honor of God, not for your satisfaction. Rightly ordering everything. Do you see? Everything has to be rightly ordered. And once it is, God will be at the center of your life. And you'll have peace. Because when God's at the center of your life and your life falls apart, that's the only thing that gives you peace is the fact that the living God is your refuge. The living God. Not your pocketbook. Not your, not your job. Not your 401k. They can all just be dissolved just like that. The living God. St. Paul again says, Be ye therefore followers of God as most dear children. And that's where you can hear him saying, come out of her, my people. Be therefore followers of God as most dear children. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetedness, let it not as much be even named among you as becometh saints. He didn't talk about the saints, those who had gone before him. He called those who are living the faith right now, saints. We don't have to go around saying that. We have a different perspective. 
but we have to have the right understanding of it. If you are in a state of grace and striving in every way you can to satisfy our dear Lord because you love him, that's what the saints are. That's someone who's living in communion with our Lord or striving to. That's what he made us for. Holiness is those who are, or being a saint is those who are holy. We are called to be holy, right? So we have to put all fornication and uncleanness and covetousness, anything that's unbecoming, and he goes on, or obscenity, or foolish talking. Do you see how we have to be reserved, even in talking? Yep, even you all there in the world, you have to be reserved in your speech, not being frivolous in your speech, not talking about stupid stuff, but being serious. Someday you will be, hopefully, before the living God. And your mouth was made for that moment, not this moment. Your mouth is made to praise him for eternity, not to talk about weird stuff here today. Or obscenity, or foolish talk, or silly talk. That is to no purpose, but rather giving thanks. Giving thanks when you lose your job. Giving thanks when your coworkers beat up on you. Giving thanks when everything goes wrong in your life. Giving thanks when the death in your family comes. Giving thanks when you get the, the report you got cancer. All the different hardships that are going to come and always come. Giving thanks in all things. Because he knows all things. All of them. And he only gives what's good. Do you see? That's why we give thanks, because he knows. Before we read it in the Franciscan Book of Saints, and I know you've all heard me say it, it's always counted as a blessing when a saint was told the day of his death ahead of time. But yet we're told we have cancer, and it destroys us, and we get mad at God, and we go through a fight with God, and we're not on speaking terms with him anymore. You just got told you just got told, you got time. You, you, you're going out, and you're, you know when you're going to go out. You, you got like six months left, and you, you've just been given this grace to prepare. To, to do beautiful, heroic things that you've lacked and neglected to do up until now. Now you can do it, because you know, six months I'm dead. I'm going to do everything for him now. I'm just going to do it now. And I'll make reparation for not doing it before, but I'm just going to go out in a bang doing good. And I don't mean just going out like working at soup kitchens. I mean loving the living God, saying your prayers, loving your neighbor, spilling yourself out in holiness, striving to become Christ. Do you see? What a blessing to hear. You are going to die. Thanks be to God. Because you're all going to die. Do you know anybody who's never died? <laughs> no, that, that's why they put statues up of people that we don't know who they are, but they put these statues up and you got to go read. We, the, the, we, everybody dies. It's always happened, but yet we're always just so worried about it. You're going to die. I love talking to Abba Dane. He, he just is always like, I don't know, I might just die in a car accident on the way home. I mean, I'll be, it'll be a bloody death and then they don't want to have to have it. <laughs> he's just so he's so flippant about death like yeah one of the brothers just died and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> because we're all going to die that's what you do we, we, we have to live strongly the faith and then die and go to heaven and love God you were made for that moment not this one this one is to get you to that one does that make sense but you have to ingrain that because being in the world and of the world we don't believe it we refuse to believe it. It's always, the faith is always something I can do later. I can do a little bit later. No. And I'm guilty of it. You know, even as a friar, you know, we get, we're dealing with the bees and stuff, like they're swarming all the time. You're running after them. They're stinging you. And you're just thinking about, man, I'm a bad beekeeper. And the bees must hate me. And you don't think anything about God. Instead, you just try, you, you know, whatever you're doing, you should be just be serving God. There you go. It doesn't matter necessarily what you're doing, if it's good and holy, but you can do it for God. You know, mowing the lawn, you can do for God. But if you just mow the lawn to mow the lawn, you're just doing a worldly thing. You have to mow the lawn, do it for God. That means do it well. So the young people, that's, that's why we do things well. We don't do it because mom and dad are going to see or I might get paid or I'm not going to do it well because I'm not going to get paid. You do it simply because 
you have an opportunity right now as a Christian to merit. Our Lady, when she buttered the bread of, the, uh, of our dear blessed Lord, because she buttered his bread out of the most abundant love, she merited, who knows, maybe it was infinite, I don't know, but she merited extraordinarily because she did it with abundant love. Now, when you're buttering bread and you're just doing it because mom told me to butter the bread or whatever I got to do and you're mad because you got to butter the bread, you're just buttering bread. And you're probably going to have to go to confession for buttering the bread. <laughs> you see? So everything has to do with love because God is love. When you enter into the essence of God through your actions, that might be a strange way to say it, but what I mean is to live who God is, it be just a love. You can't go wrong with it. So though you're doing something you hate, you got to do it anyways. So do it out of love. And there you go. You just, you just please the living God. Do you see? For know you this and understand that no fornicator or unclean or covetous person, which is a server of idols, we think there isn't idolatry anymore, but that's what these sins are a server of idols, hath inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. We have to understand this affects many people in our world right now. No fornicator or unclean or covetous person. There's so many sexual problems out there. We can't just allow it to just be one of these un, uh, unfortunate things that's happening in the world. We have to give good example and pray. There isn't much we can do about it, but I'll tell you what you can do. If you become holy, God hears your prayers. And when he has holy people around, he, he might let you be persecuted too. But persecution of holy people, because St. Peter talks about it, and to suffer as a Christian, that's a good thing for us. We thank God for it. And it brings down mercy on people. And that's how they get conversion. Do you see? We can't be okay with the state of things. We have to want everything to be conformed to God and His holy will. But it doesn't mean we have to go around cutting people's heads off because they're not living properly. No, no. We have to strike them with grace, meaning we have to live a holy life so that they can receive the grace to be holy. Do you understand the difference? Getting caught up with all this criticism and the news and the, um, all the controversy, that, that necessarily isn't our way forward, but to strike them with grace. We want their conversion. It's not to say we don't speak out sometimes. There's things that have to be said. There's, 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 there's moments that have to be fought. Um, but it doesn't mean that that's all we do. And we, we leave off the grace and the charity and the good example. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the anger of God upon the children of unbelief. Be ye not therefore partakers with them. Come out, my people. For you were, were henceforth, I'm sorry, for you were heretofore darkness, but now you're light, grace. The, the, the darkness was gone with baptism. If you fell back into it, it was gone by repentance and the Holy Sacrament of Confession. Now you are light. If you are darkness still, the light's right there. Our Lord, as long as you're in this life, he wants to give you the light back. Confession. <clears throat> he will freely give it. Walk then as children of the light. That means don't sin. Don't sin anymore. You don't have to sin. You don't have to be slaves of the world. You don't have to love what it loves. You can love the living God. And you can do good. You can pray. You don't have to go out there and do all the things they do. You don't have to revel in their revelry. You don't have to sin, but to be children of light. For the fruit of the light is in all goodness and justice and truth. Remember our Lord's truth. It's in our Lord. Providing what is well-pleasing to God and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, we do have to fight against them. 
it's tough, but some of you that work in the workplace where you've got very strange things that happen, you know, we avoid, the re we, we avoid reproving them because we know we will have our head cut off for it. Sometimes we have to do it, especially when they, when they, when they flat out want to always say, um, I forget all the initials, all these ways they do bad words nowadays, but they put our, our Lord's name in all the bad words out there in the world. I don't hear it. People are respectful enough that we don't normally hear that kind of stuff. Even when I was in Italy, I never learned a single curse word in Italian. So I'm sure I heard them at some point, but I never knew anybody was cursing. I, I, I wouldn't know a single one, right? But the things that one of our third order members was telling me on the phone the other day, I don't know how she bore it. To hear the things she had to hear at work, the way they talk about our dear Lord, and the, the filthy words they use before and after his name. Sometimes we have to reprove them. We have to reprove them, even if it means we have to shed our blood. And that, just reprove them is just letting them know it's not okay. You're talking about my dearly beloved Lord. Because if I went and started talking about their mother or somebody else, they'd smack me or get me arrested or something. They're talking about my God who saves me who's kept me from all kinds of horrible things, who's brought me into religion and everything else, all the, all the wonderful, who, who provides. Now, you, you all understand, we friars, we don't have jobs. I haven't had insurance in like 18 or 20 years. He's always provided everything. When I walked 800 miles, I didn't have anything. I didn't know anybody. And when I really needed it, he provided me something very special, even to the point of asking for a beer. He even gave me a beer one day when I, was, I wanted a beer, which I thought was a weird thing to ask for from God. And he still gave me a beer. For the things that are done of them in secret, it's a shame to even speak of. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. The final judgment comes. This is where, no matter how badly you're treated in giving this good example, in striving to separate yourself from the filth of this world, people aren't going to understand you. Your relatives aren't going to understand you. Your best friends are going to leave you. My, my, what I have found in religious life is you lose everything. And you know, as a religious, you just say bye to it. Because there will be... Um, you know that most of them will be saved. Not well, I don't know about most of them, but you, you hope that they'll be saved and you'll see them in heaven. And we'll, we'll all understand ourselves again. It won't matter that, that couple of years where there was discord or whatever. It'll all be resolved. It'll all be resolved. Because the final judgment resolves everything. Either to your shame or to your glory. Do you see? And so that's why when we, when we suffer and have to face all these difficulties, which we will have to face, um, the final judgment, that moment lasts forever. Because now you're in eternity. It's not like you have the final judgment and then tomorrow we're just kind of whistling and walking around in the park in heaven and there's birds and stuff and different kind of flowers you've never seen. It's nice there. That's not really kind of the way heaven works, right? But the final judgment, it'll manifest everything you've had to suffer and when you were right and everything else. And so the justification will come from it, and you'll be applauded for all of eternity, for all the suffering you've had to endure for our dear blessed Lord. Do you see? That the final judgment for those uh, who have striven to love our dear Lord, it is a joyous moment. For Mary Magdalene, who sinned a great deal, even her sins were, will be reputed to her as glory because she repented of them. It's beautiful. Wherefore, mm, sorry, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for all that is made manifest is light, because it's truth. Darkness is falsehood. Light is truth. That's what he means. Wherefore, he saith, Rise thou that sleepeth, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall enlighten thee. This is our repentance. 
This is repentance that we need, right? We have to turn away from Babylon. We have to embrace or strive to embrace this gospel way of life, which is difficult. It is difficult. But what it takes is constant. If you're going to do that, if you're going to do the marathon, you've got to go run every day, or at least most days, right? You've got to get out there. You've got to keep going. With, with the faith, we have to do the same thing. We've just got to keep running and running and running. And you say, well, I'm tired. I've been beat up. I'm wounded. Keep running and keep running and keep running. Because you think about how heroic it is. A soldier that, that fights his way all the way through the line to get a message in and dies right there when he gets the message in. Heroic. Soldier is a hero, right? Well, it's not by chance they call those who are confirmed soldiers of Christ. And we, should, we, need to, we do need to remember that. We have to fight and fight and fight. The older you get, the harder it is to fight. That's why you develop the virtue at a young age. And if it's hard for you because you're just starting the fight now that you're older, just keep fighting and fighting and die in utter exhaustion in the spiritual fight, right? You will be rewarded. See, therefore, brethren, how you walk circumspectly, not as unwise, but as wise, Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming your time, not wasting your time. Frivolously wasting a little bit of time. Young people want to sleep in till noon. What a waste. I never slept in till noon when I was a kid. I, well, maybe I did at some point in time. But you, 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 you got to get up. You go, you go into the forest. Well, back then we used to go into the forest and we'd ride our bikes and jump ramps that our, people, our parents didn't know how big they were and that we would probably die if we landed improperly. So, you know, you're looking to get out there, but first you got to clean the house. You got to get up early. You clean the house, you get on your bike, and you're gone all day long, right? You don't want to waste it, but that, that's the state of life of a child is to play. Well, St. Paul says, but when I got older, I put away childish things, right? It's not our state of life, the ones that are older. And some of the younger people, it still is, and your job's still to play responsibly according to the guidance of your parents. But ours is to put those things away and whatever our duty is, not to be lazy in them, but to fight through them. Do you see? That's why that word relaxation, I don't like it. When you hear a friar saying, I just want to relax. You want to do what? <laughs> <laughs> we don't do that here, all right? I mean, we'll rest, but we're not going to relax. I don't know what you... <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> And be not drunk with wine, wherein is luxury, right? Luxury, effeminacy, relaxation, they're all kind of things that circle around each other. But be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. And we will leave it right there. Be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. So let's go back to our dear Lord in the Apocalypse. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Go out from her, my people, that you may not be partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto the heavens, and the Lord hath remembered her iniquities, rendered to her as she hath also rendered to you. This, is, this might sound confusing. Rendered to her as she hath also rendered to you, and double upon her, double according to, Let's see, and double under her, double according to her works, in the cup wherein she hath mingled, mingle ye double under her. That much more the world has come after us. That much more the world has made us drink from her, her chalice, as it were, her sacred chalice of iniquity. The more she's, she's brought us into that, we have to give the double portion. And the way you give it back Holiness. Give her a double portion. Don't just make reparation for what you've done. Go far and beyond. That's what the saints do. They make reparation for everything that they do and they just keep going, keep going. And that's why when we pray to the saints, it's all the merit. God saw such beautiful works happen in them. That's their treasure. And so when I say, Saint Isidore, help me, I'm taking care of the bees or I've got to... <clears throat> We got to do some, we got to harvest some trees, or I got to do some farming thing, because St. Andrew Isidore is in charge of farming stuff. He was a third order Franciscan. <clears throat> How do I obtain a grace from St. Isidore? 
St. Isidore has the living God who loves St. Isidore and is so thankful for all that St. Isidore did, all the merit that he did. And he says, I will grant that from your treasury. I'll grant that request. You see? Well, that's not just St. Isidore. That's what we're all called to do. And that's what it means when I said earlier that we, 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 we live that heroic faith, giving good example, drawing down graces by a heroic life lived in imitation of our Lord. That's how we save our neighbor. That's the, that's the most efficacious way to save your neighbor, to strike them with grace. Do you see? So give, 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 give them a double portion. As much as she hath glorified herself and lived in delicacies, so much torment and sorrow give ye to her. That is the repentance and a holy life. Because she hath said in her heart, I sit a queen and I am no widow and sorrow I shall not see. Go out of her, my people, that you may not be partakers in her sins and that you not receive her plagues. Does that make sense? So anyways, I just wanted to give the little talk to give you some encouragement. For the formation, it's one of those things that we want we, we want the third order to be a real, uh, an efficacious um, uh, instrument in fighting against what we're faced with today. And that's basically an apostasy. Even with Catholics, we, we're just, most Catholics don't believe the faith anymore. And they know it by the polls. And when you, when you see those low numbers of people that believe in the Eucharist, um, that's because a lot of those people that are saying they believe in the Eucharist, they just know that's the belief of, of the church. <laughs> so they try to answer right because they don't want to get it wrong, right? But people don't believe anymore. Um, what will get them to believe? Christ will. He's the truth. But we have to live the truth. We have to be Christ. Let's say a quick prayer, then I'll take questions if there are any questions because sometimes I say things that don't make any sense or say them backwards.